Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday YouTube channel. I am your host, Ryan Hartley. This channel is for heart-centered leaders just like you. I hope our time spent together helps you leave a heart print where those around you are left better than yesterday. These interview sessions are sponsored by our great friends at Elevate Online Marketing. On today's episode number 197, I'm joined by Dr. Gordon Newfeld. He is the author of best-selling book, Hold On To Your Kids, co-authored with Dr. Gabor Mate. Before he retired, Dr. Gordon had accumulated more than 40 years of experience as a clinical psychologist with children and youth and those responsible for them. He's a foremost authority on child development and he continues to be an international speaker. He's the best-selling author of Hold On To Your Kids and a leading interpreter of the developmental paradigm. Dr. Neufeld has a widespread reputation for making sense of complex problems and for opening doors for change. While formerly involved in university teaching and private practice, he has devoted the best part of the last two decades to creating courses for parents, teachers, and helping professionals. These courses are offered primarily through the Neufeld Institute. You can find the link within the show notes. It is an online educational institute and a worldwide charitable organization devoted to applying developmental science to the task of raising children. Dr. Gordon's life's work has been to help adults provide the conditions for children to flourish. He's a father to five and a grandfather to seven. What an honour and a privilege it is to have Dr. Gordon Neufeld on today's episode number 197. Please do share this with another parent you wish to inspire. Dr. Gordon Neufeld, welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast. How are you? I'm just fine. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Do you know what? Your book, Hold On To Your Kids, has been an absolute blessing. Uh, it, it has been such a wonderful resource. And, and I, I think, fortunately, I found it in time. You know, my eldest is nine. Mm. It'll be 10 by the point that this goes out in a couple of weeks' time. And my youngest is seven. And uh, uh. It's come at a really good time. I'm really learning some incredible things and, and I'm grateful for you to be here so I can help share those uh, wonderful learnings with, with our mm. audience. Well, this is a, <laughs> these are good ages to be able to understand this. And in fact, it's never too early. The preschoolers is a good age as well to have some sense of how important the child parent relationship is in the scheme of things. Mm, I'm learning so much. And, uh, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we're at a time now where there's more resources than ever. There's mm. more <laughs> parenting experts, shall we say, inverted. You yes. know, that, and yet we seem to be struggling more than ever. Why, why do you think that is? Well, well there's a hidden secret. It's, it's <laughs> it, Nature had already taken care of things. You know, We've been raising children mm. for millennia, for thousands and thousands of years. And, uh, and our, our uh, other mammals do the same and raise their offspring. So uh, this was all taken care of as long as there was a culture that was, uh, was uh, uh, congruent with this but it's a bottom up arrangement and that's what what's hidden people think mm. the answer is in knowing how to be a father and knowing mm. how to be a mother and learning how to do it and you've got extra things to do if you didn't have good uh, good uh, you know uh, a, a, a functioning family yeah. and and so so it's about what you're what you do so the question is is what should i do and it's a wrong question because it, it is a bottom-up relationship. The, the question should be is how do I preserve the natural context in mm. which parenting would be in, intuitive, the child would be easier to take care of, would be, oh, that's the context. And, and nobody's asking the, that question because they all think it has to do with them. And it doesn't have to do with them. Like I, I, I'll never forget my experience mm. as mm. A, I, I have seven grandchildren now. The last mm. one is just two weeks old. So wow. I'm, I'm still in the yeah, <laughs> uh, in that uh, uh, you know wonderful afterglow of uh, oh, of the birth of a new grandchild, but I, I remember in the, in grandchildren, I think it was number uh, number five and six. <laughs> they were close in age, boys. They both uh, they were about uh, um, six to nine months of age, and uh, 
both daughters happened to come on on the same day uh, because they had uh, they had appointments in town for one reason and the question was uh, is dad can you take care of uh, you know of of my boy <laughs> so i had two boys there now the one was wonderfully attached to me Mm. and the other one was not but get the irony in canada i'm known as an expert in parenting and you know my <laughs> book was a be was a bestseller uh, uh you know at that time i've i've uh, i probably you know i with five kids i've accumulated so much parenting experience yeah, and yeah. all of this and yet i had absolutely no natural power to take care of mm. the one grandson he look, one look at me and I, he knew I was the enemy. I, mm -hmm. I was the one who separated him from his mother. Sure. It, it's, it's a bottom up arrangement. And, and that's mm -hmm. what we don't realize. We, we think it is in the books we read. We think it is in the skills mm -hmm. we acquire. We think mm -hmm. it is in how hard we work as, as a father, as a mother. We think mm -hmm. it is on mm -hmm. how responsible we are. It's a bottom up arrangement. All of that counts for nothing if the child does not is not attached to you and so that becomes the priority is the context in which the parent and the, the word context is very interesting because uh, as you know a con with text words right mm -hmm. it's that which comes with the words but is not the words so it's the part mm. that's invisible, like Shakespeare. There was a context for all mm. his plays. Now, he never wrote down that context. He only gave us the script. So we have the script, and we have mm -hmm. to rework the context, because the context means is everything, how you interpret everything. And that's the problem, is it's hidden from view. And that's why we're in more trouble than ever, because what is the most significant issue is hidden from view. And, and uh, that's, that's why the book, that's why I talk about it, <laughs> is, is, you know, to be able to, to get the words that can open the door to consciousness. Mm. Yeah, let's step through that door. You talk about the book being, the purpose of the book being a, a radical intent of reawakening people's natural parenting instincts. And, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to be in the corner of, of many women, of parents and mothers. And there's something about society and education that's almost going, it's not even like, it's not taking them away from their instincts. It's going against those very instincts. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's both. It's mm. taking them away and we are being educated out of our instincts. Yeah is because we're going to our head yeah. and the answer are is actually in our hearts mm. i mean our hearts are in our head but i mean <laughs> when we talk about neuroscience but you know, yeah. as a metaphor yeah. it uh, it is when uh, it's uh that uh, the, the education brings us to the realm of thinking and the realm of distrusting culture Mm -hmm. And all that went before, because mm -hmm. unless it, it, it so it, it brings us to a rational place when when there's nothing about it that is rational about love. Like when you're attached to somebody, you are moved to take care of them. You're simply moved to. It's an instinctual emotional experience you're moved to take care of. The better you can make sense of them the more effective that care is and if they're attached to you they're receptive to that care so the most educated people in the world can absolutely flunk as parents you you could yeah. have read a thousand books you could have you could have written a thousand books it still <laughs> doesn't it still doesn't mean that you're the answer to your child Hey, my friends, I hope you're enjoying the interview so far. Just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know that we are in the middle of our first cohort of Good Fathers, a six-week group coaching program for dads. It is my heart to create a space for these good men, to leave them better for those who call them dads. We're having some intentional, purposeful conversations that I can see the men in front of me are transforming in front of my eyes. They are having conversations that they've never had with anyone else and it is powerful and it is going to help them be much more loving and intentional fathers, intentional partners. And because I have such undying belief in the power of this group, I am bringing about a second cohort. 
starting on Monday the 9th of January 2023. We're going to kick off with Cohort 2. If you are a dad that wants to be even better for those who call you dad, then head over to the website abty.co.uk forward slash goodfathers. The link is in the show notes. Have a look and it'd be my honour and privilege to have you come and join us and other good men from around the world as we journey in what it means to be a good father. Here we go. Back to the interview. Mm. What are then the unseen forces at play? Well, attachment is the is the preeminent force. It's it, it's um, it's that which keeps the atom together, the mm-hmm. universe together. It's uh, 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 it's 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 everything. My own background was in natural science as a physicist yeah. and chemist, mm-hmm. a chemist, and and it's all mm-hmm. about attachment. Uh, there's nothing outside of the science that isn't about attachment and. Uh, so when I began to understand attachment, it, it, it just opened the universe. Mm. What we, I, I think the best way we can understand it is the, the way the, the nucleus of the atom takes mm-hmm. care of the electron is mm-hmm. because of the electron's attraction or attachment to the nucleus is able to hold it to contain it mm. and and so it gives the power the the earth can take care of the moon only because of the moon's attachment to the earth the sun can take care of the earth and all the inhabitants of the earth only because of attachment and so on and so on and so on mm. and that is the key to survival in mammals yeah. is is it seems that nature and its evolutionary wisdom said that if I can get, if I can drive togetherness, then that will increase the the probability of survival in mammals. And so our preeminent need, many people think is to survive. It's not, that's the yeah. fruit. Sure. Our need is for togetherness. Mm-hmm. And if we have togetherness, it's linked to the emotional system of caring. Uh, to care for, to receive care, to be cared for, to mm-hmm. care about, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, uh, uh, that's that's the bottom line. So it's it's the most, it's un, it's undoubtedly. If you look at the atom, you realize it's the most powerful force in the universe. There's nothing like it. Uh, it it's the tendrils of attraction that you don't see in the universe. Yeah. You see the 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 stars. You don't yeah. see what holds the universe together, and that's the same as humans. We look, we see. I, you know, I see my granddaughter, but what, what is it that holds things together? It's her attachment to her mother, which enables her to latch, to be mm. fed, to be nurtured, to hold on to, et cetera. It's all about attachment. And that's what we don't see. And I don't think we were ever meant to see it, frankly. Mm. I, I don't think we were meant to be conscious. I don't think <laughs> we were meant to analyze love. I don't, I think we were left to leave it as poetry, as philosophy. Yeah. I, I don't think we were meant to do this because when we do it, we, yeah. we become too self-conscious about it. And we think that there is something that we can do about it. I, mm. But things aren't working for us. So that's why, yeah. it, you know, in this case, l- knowledge is the lesser of evils, right? And so that's why we need to think about it. That's part I could listen to that all day. You're speaking right to my heart. And um, one of the one of the things that I know you talk about so much is is peer orienting. Is peer orienting something that gets in the way of attachment between oh. a parent, or is it something that replaces a lack of attachment? Both. Yeah. Both. Uh, it's it's the answer to that is both. Um, the second phase of attachment is to be the same as to right. imitate, to emulate. And that's at two years of age or the second year of of life, that is behind the acquisition of language, mannerisms, mm-hmm. all kinds of things like that. It enables us to be able to, 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 to parent. What we, because it's so close to us, we don't see it. Aristotle thought that, uh, I mean, he's the father of attachment, really, because he was the one who led with the observation that, you know, to his fellow philosophers, hey, guys, you notice how much we want to hang out together. But it, it was a half-truth. 
Yeah. But he got it wrong. Mrs. Aristotle would have said, hey, come on, <laughs> you need to be more attached to your children, your grandchildren, and your children to you, you yeah. know, because this is what makes the work go wrong. So didn't see the hierarchy of it. Mm -hmm. That's what made Bowlby that the, the 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 one we usually think of the you know as uh, John Bowlby as a father of attachment so brilliant is because he realized the fatal flaw in mm. in the the social construct and the social mm. construct was about peers and in actual fact it's about family it's yeah. about the village of attachment it's about hierarchy now that has eclipsed the truth for millennia. So yeah. when we think of it, we think of it as our social needs. When we think of social needs, we think of peers. So we're concerned with two-year-olds having play dates with each other. The problem is, is that it is so attractive when they're around those who appear to be the same as them, they start mm. gravitating around each other. And that continues on and on and on. And so we assume because it's normal, it's natural and it is and and it is when children are pulled into orbit around each other they're pulled out of orbit around the adults who are meant to take care of them their teachers mm. the grandparents their mm. their parents and and then we think it's because we don't know enough and so that we need to read some books, we need to do this, we need to listen to podcasts, yep. you know, and so on. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we we think it's it's you know in our knowledge, but yes, it is. They're pulled out of orbit. It started shortly after the Second World War. It was dismissed as an artifact of the war because it was men who fought the war, and so it was considered an artifact of of uh, you know relatively speaking a fatherless society, mm -hmm. and uh, it was dismissed uh, and in the 1960s, and then it moved so quickly that now we even have grandparents who prefer to be in each other's company than mm -hmm. to assume their role in the family, taking care mm -hmm. of the parents who take care of the children. It's meant to be cascading care. And so that's been totally eclipsed. Um, um, Bowlby was brilliant in this observation, but he also observed that I don't think that this will go down, down well in public uh, because they don't like to think in terms of hierarchy. They prefer yeah. to think in terms of lateral relationships, horizontal relationships rather than vertical relationships. Yeah, one thing I'm observing is that in, in today's modern world with you know almost a suspicion you know there's a there's a world of i guess where we've been projected onto that the world is an unsafe place yeah we've projected that onto the people around us so that so i the, the understanding i took from your book is that there are less safe extensions of us in our communities you know in in some ways that um i'm just going to pause there because i think i've frozen can you hear me okay Yes, I can. You just pause, yeah. you just pause for just a, a, a second. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, as I reflected on your book, I think there, there are, I think people are awkward and clumsy around how to um, be that caregiver to someone else's child in, in society in community, yes. even with like um, sports groups, I coach oh, um, yes. boys football and rugby, it's you have to go through safeguarding training and everything becomes up here and oh, I don't want to say and do the wrong thing. Yes, yes. And I found that fascinating. Yes, it, it, it has been that. Well, we have become sensitized and vigilant. Well, sensitized more than vigilant, I suppose, yeah. about the abuse of power yeah yeah and and that is a good thing and but once again we throw out the baby with a bath sure mm -hmm. is that yes power can be abused yes food can be abused i uh, there anything good can be abused yeah. and and the more we need it the more abused it can be but there is no pregnancy without attachment without an umbilical cord without the placenta there is no 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 true parenting without the attachment of the child to the adult that's why it's so hard to step into parenting for mm. step parents it's so difficult why because the step parent could have raised their own family could have been the most wonderful father and mother but 
it, they don't realize it's a bottom up. It, it mm. you know, we, we take credit for these things. It's it, it actually it's our our children who are attached to us that make us the master parents, the master teachers that we become. Yeah. And teaching yeah. is the same thing. If you look back at your own own educational career. Who will have been the most influential teachers to you mm. will have been the teachers you would have had a relationship with. Mm. They would have been not the best teachers. They would have been the teachers you had a relationship with. And that even extends to university. We have so much evidence of this that even extends into university. And so it, it again, is a bottom-up arrangement. I, Socrates is, is said to have, I mean, this is legend, but is said to have said, <laughs> that's awkward saying it that way that when he was confronted with the with the flaw in the socratic method he said well you know with a particular student he said why well, i couldn't teach him he didn't love me <laughs> which yeah, yeah, which if yeah. you take away the charged nature of love in our today society is yeah. i couldn't teach him i didn't have a context he didn't have a relationship with me he wasn't yeah. you know and so on and uh, the teachers today don't have that awareness they're trying to teach harder and, and because they've lost their students, it's not that students are, are, aren't as smart. They're probably yeah. smarter than ever. It, yeah. it, it isn't that the students have so many attention problems. It's that we don't attend to those to whom we're not attached. Hmm. And, and so the fact is, is as we lose the attachments, we lose the ability to raise children. Yeah. Uh, the word raise literally means to bring to potential. Yes. So we, we have difficulty raising them to potential. And that starts at infancy. And that's even to my adult children, like my oldest, oldest two are in their 50s. Yes. And my role as a father is still to do as much as I can to take care of them so that they can take care mm. of their children and to yeah. take the weight off their marriages, their relationships. Because the more weight that goes on that, you mm. <laughs> You know, it's, mm. it's difficult enough. Right. The more weight is on it, the more you're likely to trip over each other. And so it's just cascading care. It's a beautiful oh, design. And it's very fulfilling to know your role in this. I love that. I hope that uh, many, many of the men listening to this are, are, because I think, you know, men want to feel purposeful. You know, many, many men really want to feel purposeful and, and have a yeah. meaningful role and an impact in, in the home. And yes. And that, that's, I love the way that you've described that, you know, and I think one of the things that you just to fall off the back of what you said is that um, when you lose the attachment, then the child loses the will to do good and to please. Yes. And can you expand yeah. on that? Well, the, 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 the desire to be good, it's no different than the pets. If, if your, if your dog is not attached to you, you're going to have difficulty training them. If your mm -hmm. horse is not attached to you, you're going to have difficulty in the sense of, of, of managing them. Yeah it's it's no different than children in fact it's much more than children because we're very complex creatures and and so the natural desire to be good it is so natural we want to be good for those to whom we're attached to that's mm. true as adults as well mm. we want we want to be good for in fact there's a natural protection if we're not attached if somebody tells us what to think or what to do and we are not engaged at that moment attaching it feels as if we are being bossed around and coerced and and mm. we are resistant to it uh, we're allergic to coercion mm -hmm. I, I call that counter will uh, yes. after or, uh, yeah and that's huge i've seen a fair amount it's of counter world dr Gordon. <laughs> i'm listening very closely when we start talking about that in a minute yes <laughs> there's definitely so, things i need to learn to do better so na nature is very you know it said hey i i will i part of these attachment instincts are tend to to follow to want to be good for to want to be the same as yeah. to seek for significance from this is where all our natural power comes from now quite contrary to artificial power when you're trying to control a child and you say if you don't do this then i'm going to take this away from you is that you've got to make it known you've got to point out look this is the power I have over you. I can control mm -hmm. your resources, your access to these things. And we push our, our children's noses into it. Well, there's mm -hmm. a tremendous loss of dignity. There's mm -hmm. a resentment. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they, even if we get them, we we injure the relationship. If, if our wow. best friends or our partners did this to us, uh, my goodness, we wouldn't be best friends anymore. <laughs> we wouldn't be partners right. anymore. Yeah. So the true power is something we must never draw attention to. 
Like you don't say to your child, I know that you will listen to me here because you love me so much. You don't mm. say that. Mm. You never draw attention to where your true power comes from. And that is that is why when you really do have the power you need to do the mm. job, you're pretty quiet about its source because you know that you could lose it in a in a moment and uh, and so but again it, it's um the, the the there is nothing more i think significant to make parenting uh uh, uh doable mm. than a, than a child's natural desire to be good for that parent yeah that doesn't mean they don't trip over immaturity. It don't they don't trip over their impulsiveness and all of these things, of course. But when they when they when they have the desire to be good, and we must believe in that. It's mm -hmm. always important to believe in it because it, to not believe in it is to dismiss it, to insult uh, that process. And mm -hmm. it's 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 a wonderful dance. When once you get the hang of that dance, yeah. there there you don't have to rely on any contrived trinkets. You know, you don't have to do anything with unnatural power. I love that. I'll come on to some of the mistakes I make shortly and uh, just to see if you can uh, unpick some, <laughs> right. unpick some of those things. So I think that's what I was saying. I think two of the, the things that I really um, took from your book, which was not about how much I know, not about what I can do for my children, but it's about who I am. Yes. And, and who I also, am to them absolutely who i am to them yes not what i do not but who i am to them that is the that is the answer because i i meant to be their answer yeah I, I, that you know we say well what does a child need they need yeah. us yeah you know uh, you know they they need us and we they need us to 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 uh, to rise to that role yeah uh, yeah and, be, and because I've been so um, intentionally wanting to uh, do this parenting thing the best I can, for whatever reason that I'm driven to do that, um, I've always believed that, you know, it's about unconditionally loving the child. I love what you, you bring in Carl Rogers and talking about um, yes. the unconditional positive regard and unconditional love. And, I, and I've really tried as a man, you know, to try to be practical, trying to trying mm. to create. And then you go and add this sentence that says, well, it's it's okay to unconditionally love your child, but it's more important how the child feels about you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 yes, I, well, it's important to unconditionally <laughs> love. Yes, it's important to give an invitation to exist that transcends, that isn't withdrawn, you know, yeah, or cancelled yeah. with every mistake. However, it doesn't land with them. It doesn't get through. And so it's not that it's not important. It's just that it's not the most important. Yeah. The most important is, is, uh, is, is that uh, their attachment to you without it, without it, all the love in the world uh, is, is not going to, is not going to land. It's not going to get through. That's fascinating. Do you find some, you know, is it that every child is different? Or are there some universal principles that facilitate attachment? Well, in 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 attachment, uh, uh, there's universal principles. Uh, yeah. They apply in physics. They apply in chemistry. They apply, uh, you know, they're just universal principles. Uh, um, and there's lots of individual differences in how those are are realized. Uh, you just think of the five senses mm -hmm. and the first the the first attachment we have is through these senses mm -hmm. and every child has a dominant sense whether it's vision whether it's hearing whether it's touch and so on and so on and so it's going to change so much the nature of how you feel attached is it through smell mm -hmm. that you you know that is you know for many this is dominant and invisible in our society because we don't put a high value on it Mm -hmm. So yes, there are huge individual differences, but the bottom line is, is that a child starts off needing to be with, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but that develops very quickly in the second year to needing to be the same, and then needing to be part of or to belong, and then by the yeah. fourth year getting to need to be important or matter to. Yeah. So it just unfolds this way. What's the, um, here's one of the things I get really wrong. And it's good intentions. You know, I have a value of, you know, of, of independence. And 
the irony is in in trying to help my son be more independent i'm probably causing more problems than it's worth what is the paradox of independence yes it's a, well it's like most of the paradoxes is as adults when we don't understand nature's ways we get to be direct we, we get to think of this you know like if we didn't understand where apples came from we'd probably try to create them in the lab you know and, and we, we'd be direct about it and try to figure out how we could do this and you know at least we know where apples come from so we know we got to nurture the seeds which looks nothing like the apple and all of these yeah, kinds of things yeah. and that's a developmental process and that's true is, is we lose sight of the developmental process we don't know what's fruit and what is at the root of that fruit mm -hmm. and it, it is paradoxical like many things are par paradoxical the the you know like uh, like emotion the more room we give it the less room it takes that's paradoxical yeah. Yeah. and and that goes against all of the self-management things all the self-management is calm down in actual fact the answer to calming down is to give more room for it to and then mm -hmm. it goes in its natural uh, flow uh, uh, you know, and uh, but in this case, uh, this is huge because this has been for decades now the idea that you mustn't do anything for a child that they could or should do for themselves. Yeah. Because that would be if you gave dependence an inch, it would take a mile. When the research shows, and it's just beautiful research, is that. Yeah. When, when a child starts toddling, and this is as concrete as you can get it, but it becomes a metaphor as well. But when a child starts to toddle, the parents who say, C come here, let me pick you up. I miss carrying you. And children who say, can do it myself <laughs> and want to be put down and walk on their own two feet. And the parents yeah. who say, don't expect me to carry you. You can walk on your own two feet. Have children who are obsessed with being carried. Mm. And so the paradox is mm. nature will take care of the transition. Don't you worry about it. Our point is to is to fulfill their needs of dependence. They need us. And that is that that need is 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 huge and complex and for us to be the answer. When mm. we the, are the answer to their needs for belonging for sameness, for significance, for love, for affection to be part of, it, it that automatically moves to a, a to a, a venturing forth to be their own person. Do it yeah. myself. I can do this. I want to. And it becomes from the inside out. I would have parents over and over again say to me, how do I get my child to dress themselves? And I would say, in effect, to I mean a little bit more polite than I'm going to say it now, but you know, I, I don't care if your child wants to, you know, it, it can't dress himself. Uh, they may be paraplegic and never be able to dress themselves in their their life. Yeah. What I want is to hear from a child that they want to dress themselves. You can't teach that. You can't. Yeah. The only way you can do that is by saying, here, let me help you. Yeah. And when, it, when, when that has given the child a sense of being taken care of, yeah. their immediate response is, is to be able to become independent. Oh, and yet there's just so much of an instinct that when my nine-year-old says, can you help me? And I'm like, you can do that, buddy. <laughs> as if i'm somehow trying to enable yeah. him to, yeah. oh, well but... make it an attachment moment yeah absolutely. you see the thing is don't yeah. make it about dependence independence <laughs> is you know i yeah, yeah I, I i'd love to take care of that for you or i yeah, think i've got an idea what you do is seize the lead like if somebody asks you to dance you know, say, okay, maybe, you know, let me think of it, is you either got to say no, or your yes has to be, you know, like, oh, I'd love to. Mm -hmm. Like, because if you don't show the energy of wanting to take care of, it yeah. it will never do the job. Yeah. And so that's the part of it is we got to internally process, mm -hmm. you know, am I in or am I out here? <laughs> is there a no in me or is there a yes? But if there's a yes, then I got to see the lead on this because if I don't see the lead, my child won't relax into my care, mm -hmm. into my love. I will not meet the true dependency need there. Be I've got you. I've got your back. It's okay. You know, I'd love, yeah. I'd love to help you with this. And as soon as you do this, you can actually see the child relax into it.
Well, thank you for inspiring me to be better. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I really like what's said in, in Hold On To Your Kids is to not retire too early because to retire too early is unwittingly to abandon the child who still needs us badly. Yes. Yes. When is too early? What, what? When is too early to retire? And um, I, I, I don't think it's... I, I think it's always too early. I, I I'm I, uh, I'm reminded of my 93 year old mother who died about three or four years ago now. You know, physically, we were taking care of her, of course, as mm -hmm. as her her body deteriorated quite quickly. She was in the hospice. Emotionally, she was still taking care of each one of her children and grandchildren. It wasn't her energy, the way she was. It wasn't about her. It was about you. Are you doing okay? How's, how's you know, and each and each of the children, et cetera, et cetera. She was taking care of them. They were on her radar. She wanted to know that there, yeah. there was there. She was still the matriarch. And she was yeah. the matriarch until her last breath. And how do you be a matriarch unless you step forward and say, I've got this. I'll take care of you so you can take care of your children so the children can take care of the children. Is there a retirement from this? No. If you retire, you take the energy that is meant to go to the youngest and to the neediest and you take it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, the, 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 the physical needs are one thing. The emotional needs and the attachment needs are another. And so, you know, my... My 93-year-old mother, as I said, physically was totally dependent. Yeah. Uh, but there was a generosity yeah. of care that stayed right, right to the end. And and the thing about this is, it's not a burden. There mm. is fulfillment in this. Mm. One realizes the ultimate fulfillment. When we're young, we think, if only I could get my needs met. If only I could get somebody to love me. If only yeah. I get somebody to replace my mother, you know, my wife, and get her to take care of me and all of this. And and and, and we're so narcissistic, quite naturally. Yeah. We, we, you know, we do this. And then we become a father and we go, you know, oh, my goodness, it's not yeah. about me. Yeah. It's about the kid. And that's probably one of the first times we're really, really like my kid doesn't know what I do for a living. My kid doesn't know that I'm the most important lawyer in the business. My kid doesn't <laughs> know that I, you know, that I'm running for office and it doesn't matter. Nor do and they care. <laughs> nor do they care. And the thing that is in the fulfillment is when you know you're the answer to them, there is something that is like, my destiny is being fulfilled because it is our true developmental destiny yeah. to be the answer to those who we are, are raising. It is our developmental destiny. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And, mm -hmm. and it, it, what it does is it makes us, it, it renders us less ambitious in a good sense of that. Like we're less driving for success. The more fulfilled you are, the less you need success, the less you need success, the more likely you are to be able to navigate through the places that can lead to the kind of outcomes you need. It's, it's our, it's our drive, our ambition that often gets in the way. So this is true for moms, it's true for dads, it's true for grandmothers, it's true for grand granddads, is that we're missing one of the best sources of fulfillment ever. Uh, and this was our developmental destiny. Mm, that's really powerful. I have always um, tried to create create a clear sense of our family identity. To we're called Team Hartley, and um, we we have uh, a set of family values. We have a little mantra. Um, we've even designed our own kind of family crest and those things. And and I and I've tried to do that from a um, perspective of trying to create a sense of identity in our home. And then I read your book, and it talks about and this haunts me this haunts me and I hope that people are listening very clear is that if a child doesn't go into the world with a sense of who they are and their own values, societal values will become their cost of acceptance. Yes. Yes. But, but it, it takes time to get there. And it was answered yeah. in your other question is, is what does a child look for first? And, and uh, Ryan, that's wonderful that you are providing your family with that because that is part of attaching who am I the same as right and if you don't offer the answer to that yeah. then somebody else will offer the answer to that yeah. 
Yeah. Now, there comes a time in every four-year-old's mind when they think, daddy likes, you know, it's important for daddy that I do this, I do that, I do that, that I am good at, at, at uh, football, that I am, I, you know, can do this. And so he must love me more when I do this. Mm-hmm. And then that becomes the issue of being able to make sure that your invitation to them to exist, the twinkle in your eye, your playfulness with them is not conditional upon measuring up to your values. But they have to have those things before that that ultimate uh, ultimate mistake and flaw yeah. in our thinking. Then we have the challenge to say, you know, of course, I love it when you do well, but I love you just as much when you don't. Yeah. And yeah. and yeah. to bring home that lesson to them. And when we bring home that lesson, it does free them then to not abuse values because we mm-hmm. abuse values by thinking, you know, the, the, the smarter I am, the better yeah. I look, the yeah. more important I am. And that's not, yeah, yeah, that yeah. should not be where that leads to all kinds of problems in our society and, uh, and so on. So yes, yeah. you are doing exactly what is, what is needed. Uh, uh, and, And it sets the stage for answering the other question. Since you are a man of values, since you are holding them and making them explicit, since you give an identity, our family, we believe in this and we believe in that. You also have another question that becomes very important to answer is that my invitation to exist in my presence does not depend upon how you measure up to my values. Yeah. It's, <laughs> let's share a little story with you so one of our values is just we're heartless and we help people very simple mm. and um <laughs> and uh you know he, he was putting his shoes on he said dad can you help me i says you know in my kind of in my yeah. mistake of trying to enable him to <laughs> it's okay mate you, you could do it you could and what did he say to me dad uh, we're heartless and we help people <laughs> <laughs> well good for him <laughs> he's a very wise he was like, he's only like six yeah. or seven at the time so um well, then he also identified with that. He like he identified that, and he called you out. Uh, he did. Yeah, he did. One of the things that my wife's always trying to say to me is, "Pick your battles." And is it you know the the thing I wrestle with is it to pers- is it to persevere with values, or is that not the thing? You know, I'm probably thinking about this as I'm asking the question. But when my wife says, "Pick pick your battles," well, it, it it's. Uh, to pick your battles, another way of saying it is you've got to have a bottom line. Mm. And what's that bottom line? And if you're aware of the context of the relationship, the, you know the bottom line is, I, I love you no matter what. Yeah. That's the bottom line. So if that's the bottom line and you're in a situation where you cannot get that across, you cannot fulfill that value, you cannot do this, you you best distract, you best get out of this because you don't want to weaken your values, but you don't want to give give also communicate that uh, that my invitation for you to exist in my presence, my my delight in you is conditional. Mm. So uh, you need to be careful this way. You also need to be careful in, in, in the sense that values are not ever communicated in conflict. Values are, are communicated when there's a lot lack of conflict. So when there is a conflict, immediately the issue, whether it is with your spouse, like yep. as soon as there's a conflict, you're no longer having a discussion about values. Mm. As soon as there's a conflict, you've got another thing. How can I find my way to your side? How can I find a way to hold your hand? Because we've got to go through this with a way that doesn't endanger the relationship. And so, again, it's the idea of pick your battles is know when to retreat. Yeah. But you retreat to the bottom line. The, um, the Don't try and push through and get stuck in saying to prove your point, yeah. you know, and to be when that is that's not the issue for the kid. It's not, it, the kid is I don't think daddy likes me right now. And that's mm-hmm. the issue for the kid. I, I have a firm belief that a le- that that being a parent is probably the greatest form of leadership. Yeah. I think it's the greatest form of leadership. It's be- it's the greatest gift that we can give to the world is because in those moments, you know, is it two children having an argument? You know, one's supposed to be the parent, yes. but suddenly, that's right. suddenly there's a regression. 
Um, and, and and I tell you, my the third and final flaw that I'll, I'll add to you know the the mission is um is the is the um is the discipline, and the and the go to a level of discipline. I mean. I mean, I come from a, I've come from a generation where there was physical discipline, mm. um, which is, you know, not how I, I parent at all, not how my wife parents, but the, I, I'm discovering that the choice of discipline is equally damaging. And that is one of separation. That mm -hmm. is one of, yes, go to your room. Yes. Yes. Why is, you know, for anyone listening, why is separation a, a, uh, probably not a good use of discipline? Well, a, a, a separation is is a direct communication that um, you're only invited into my presence when you behave when you're good. And so oh, it mm. it creates a deep, deep, deep insecurity in a child. It doesn't mean that it can't be effective. It can be very effective. But again, you have to realize the bottom line. Is it a good child you want or a child who desires to be good for you? Well, I would rather have a child who desires to be good for me yeah. than to have a child compulsively good for because of fear of losing her love. And, you know, and and so the the sending a child away or the withdrawal of love or you can't be my friend now. I mean, it can be done in a thousand different ways to be able to face separation it 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 communicates that the relationship is conditional yeah. that they that the invitation is and and it also evokes powerful emotions of frustration of alarm and of a separation trigger pursuit and that the alarm part of it generally gets a child to be good because they're scared of your of the disfavor they're scared of getting into trouble but it's for the wrong reasons. Mm. It's not because they've internalized this because of alarm. The frustration part of it tends to get them into trouble mm. uh, with uh, eruptions of foul frustration of, of attacking impulses. And the intensified pursuit, you don't see the trouble. Mommy, mommy, I love you. I love you. I love you. Please, mommy, please, mommy. You know, daddy, daddy, I love you. you that intensified pursuit, the clutching, the clinging, and so on. When it comes to you, it doesn't, you, you know, it may feel a little bit uncomfortable with it. But when you see it transferred to another individual, you immediately realize, oh, my goodness, that's coming out of desperation. That's mm -hmm. not coming out of freedom. So it does a number on children emotionally, yeah. uh, in, intuitively in indigenous in, in, in old cultures, separation was never used. It, separation was the ultimate use yeah. excommunication or expelling when there was nothing else that could be done. Mm -hmm. And it was generally reserved for young adults. Yeah. And that was it never with children. You know, never, never with children. And so I guess to put I, someone into exile would be effectively to take off their survival. Their yes, it would, yeah. it would be. It would be. It would be. And 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 uh, yes, it it's you see, if we don't hold on and hence the title of the book, hold on to your kids, if they don't feel us holding on to them, yeah. bridging what went wrong and so on, then why would they hold on to us? Yeah. And if they don't hold to, on to us they're going to be seeking somebody else to orbit from around and they're not responsible to take care of them and we lose all our power to be able to do our job so it doesn't make any sense uh, that we would do it that doesn't mean we don't throw in fraction flags <clears throat> that doesn't mean we don't take responsibility that doesn't mean we don't set limits with the screens and with with digital devices. That doesn't mean all of that. What it does mean is that if you do it when a child desires to be good for you, then there's automatically the power with which to work with and to help them create the structures that is there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you don't do it when you have that power, it leads to a dangerous cycle where you try to figure out where your power does lay over the child. Yeah. And then the child feels manipulated and controlled. And that's not good. You don't want to get there. So if that happens, and then you need to step back and say, wait a minute, I, I need to find my way to my child's side here, make it safe, make the relationship safe. Now I have a context in which I may want to talk about a different language to use when they're frustrated with their sister, different kinds of things. There's all kinds of ways to do it, but we're humans, we talk. 
and we mm -hmm. should talk. Mm -hmm. The idea of consequences is 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 look, we're not we're not dogs, and we found out it doesn't even work with dogs. They yeah. still have to have a relationship with us. They still have to have the desire to be good. So the whole consequence thing is just uh, is is just it was such a wrong turn. Mm, yeah powerful i uh where was i gonna go with this the 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 thing i wanted to talk about was you know the power of devices the power of social media and i was going to take this down the road of the children being on there but i have this belief of you know it's not monkey say monkey do it's monkey see monkey do and and and, and i guess i'd like to phrase this question at the at the parents because what are the, what are the consequences of a of a child who's routinely observing a parent who isn't present because of the physical device well it's more it's it, it's not so much what they see in the lessons they learn it's that they're experiencing the disconnect yeah like, that's difficult for us in our relationships with our partners is to experience that lack of connection, not knowing, uh, constantly having to ask, what do you, you know, we, we feel that lack of connection yeah. and that, that togetherness is, is so important in, uh, uh, in, in that, that um, it, it, we, we put too much on, on that we are models. When some of these things are so powerful, they don't ever get to model because mm -hmm. they are stung by it. And it's being stung by it. Yeah. That is the the issue here, um, and uh, and so it's it's uh, it's so important. And there's a lot of things that we do that are about adults. We have a drink. We we do these things, and they don't do it. We have yeah. sex, and even if you know they don't, we don't expect them. That's not the issue. We live a different life. It's a different phase. We are parents, so that's not the issue. There's there there are lots of things that are there that we handle in different ways. Mm -hmm. Is that you know this is for when you're older. We make it very very clear. Um, and we can do the same with digital devices, mm. but the greatest issue is, is, is we, our brains were never, never e evolved to deal with digital devices, whether it's watching sports on TV, uh, on that, you know, on Sunday afternoons, when we should be with our grandparents, like, mm -hmm. are they interfering with our being able to fulfill our own developmental destiny? That's mm -hmm. where our fulfillment is. Uh, not on whether you know our football team has won, um, and I think that's where we need to confront ourselves, especially as as fathers, because we are so susceptible to things that have numbers with them, whether it's golf, whether it's anything, and so competitive mm -hmm. and so on, is that it can interfere with us moving to to uh, to take care of 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 uh, our loved ones. Yeah, many of the uh, many of the men uh, of my generation, and even my father's generation, there was an air of invulnerability. That in some way, displaying of emotion was, mm. you, you know, some form of weakness. What are some of the consequences of a child who grows up with invulnerability, and and what can what can parents do to to overcome that? <clears throat> well. It, it's it's a setting yeah. uh the stress response wisely there's wisdom in the stress response is it backs off your feelings when your feelings can't be afforded they would interfere with your job you're not going to feel on the battlefield you're not going to feel if you've got a stressful job you're not going to feel if you're in a management position you're not going to feel any of these things so the idea of when males were primarily the ones on the battlefield, and they still are, when males were the ones in in uh, in all of those things that are like battle in the workplaces, mm -hmm. uh, when they were in these places in combatant kind of jobs, it makes perfect sense. The issue is is this is not what was supposed to be at home. Is that when we got home, our feelings were meant to come back, and if they didn't, we needed to find a way. 
do we need to take our emotions to to uh, to some emotional playgrounds, uh, to music, to story? Do we need some place to get our hearts back? Because we can't properly parent without a soft heart. Mm. And so it's not so much that we are situationally defended. I'm extremely situationally defended when I'm at work. I, I'm simply too shy and too sensitive to be able to afford feeling when I am having to, like I worked in three prisons and I couldn't feel a thing. Mm. I couldn't feel a thing. I, 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 I would have been, I, I would have been bleeding from every place to, to be sensitive to what was going on. But when I got home, all my feelings came back. And that is what was needed to do to be the father my children needed and the grandfather my grand. And when I wasn't able to find that, I had to back off on that job. It was a very interesting thing. I said, I mm. simply don't have the luxury of somebody being all there for me to be able to be a safe place for my feelings to bounce back. And I hadn't discovered play at that point. And I think that was a basic thing. And ours says, I now that there's an alternative i know the music that allows my emotions to play i know the stories that can come and do this but so it, the fact is is it's it's not so much to that i i think probably because we're more easily innately wounded as males and there's literature to suggest this that there that that is why we're more likely to be defended and it's because we're more likely to be defended that we do the things that shouldn't you know that uh, are difficult to do in a sense uh, to be feeling but that is where we need to to put it in its place and we need to find a way of of getting our feelings back of having soft hearts because our our children our adolescents our spouses need us to have soft hearts we to be to be able to love and be capable of feeling loved we need to feel our pain we need to feel our hurt. That's all part of it. And that's, that's, that's uh, nothing could be more important. And so I think it, it becomes us as males to be able to, uh, to do what we need to do when we need to do it in society, but it would become us even more as fathers, as husbands, as grandparents, mm. uh, to, to find a way of getting those feelings back, which, which give us the soft hearts. Our eyes need to be soft. There needs to be a twinkle there. We need to find our playfulness again. We need to convey that I, I'll take care of you. I've got you. Mm. We need to be a safe place for them. You are safe in my presence. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's hard, isn't it? And, and, and I think, you know, there are children up and down the country all across both of our countries there are adults who who have learned that um that vulnerability is the enemy and yes. and, I, and i guess that's kind of the 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 arising of bullying you know bullying in the workplace yes. That, yes. that that if i'm not able to be vulnerable then the vulnerability i see in you i attack yes yes and that's exactly the essence of a bully is to take advantage of the vulnerability vulnerable rather than when you have a soft heart you move to take care of the vulnerable uh, when you are defended against your feelings you move to exploit that vulnerability to one up uh, to you know to to do something that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, affirms your own superiority which is which is dreadful there's so many bullies in in uh, in our society now that are in leadership Yes. 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 Um, I want to be super respectful of your time. I'm very, very grateful of, of our conversation. And there is a word that I use here always better than yesterday to describe um, the legacy of our work, the legacy of our interactions. And that word is called heart print. I believe that when we bring called our heart, heart print. Heart, heart print. Yeah. It's like a fingerprint, but I believe that mm. our heart leaves a print on those who we interact with yeah. and and you've been putting some incredible work out for for over 50 years you've brought many many wonderful human beings into this world and and the impact i just wonder whether you've ever stopped to consider what your heart print might be hmm. no uh, well hopefully Hopefully it would be my belief and trust in the benevolence of nature, that it's in our nature 
to be loving, caring beings. It's in our possibility to have soft hearts, even when we have to do hard things. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe it's uh, what I've been told sometimes, the feedback I get is that uh, you you seem to care a lot about children. And I'm glad if that comes through. <laughs> You know, I, I'm glad if that is that that would be a wonderful heart print to have is is to uh, to appeal to uh, to appeal to well, what do we say? Whose quote was it to to people's better nature in that way? Um, yeah, what's it about children that captures your heart? Oh, uh, I I. Uh, You, it's it's just like gardening when you're able to to look at that that uh, that child the the plant and you have a sense of the potential that can unfold from it and you have a sense of the conditions that are are conducive to want to be part of that process i mm. i i uh, yeah I've rarely met a child I didn't like, but I think the liking is being able to make sense of them. If you can make sense of them, you can like them. And if, if you can see where something comes from, on occasion I did in the prison when I, I couldn't find my way there. But for the most part, uh, for the most part, I, I think if we if we see them, that the answer is in our eyes. Yeah. If we see them, if we see them correctly, it, it, it uh, uh, our heart goes out to them. Yeah, and I think is I think one of the things I've got written down here is that you said once you understand the emotions, you're able to make sense of them. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, Doctor Gordon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Well, my for your, pleasure, Ryan. For your your conversation. Yeah. I uh, yeah, my pleasure. I I, I didn't uh, yeah, have an interesting way of leading to your confessions. You know, in <laughs> terms of this and. Uh, obviously uh, leading in what you believe in is that vulnerability and way of doing things. So all the best to you and your podcast. And, and thank you for inviting me to be part of it. I'm so grateful for you. And I'd be honored if you'd leave us with a final thought from your good self. A final thought for? From your good self. Oh, from my good self. <laughs> well, uh, the most important thing is to believe that you are your child's answer. It, uh, it brings things out in you that uh, stretch you far beyond what you ever thought you were capable of um, and brings us to our best selves. Yes and amen. Dr. Gordon, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for making it to the end of the interview here on YouTube. I hope that our time spent together has left you a little bit better than before you push play. Before you go anywhere, please leave a comment down below. Some of your key reflections, your key takeaways. I love hearing from you and what this conversation has inspired in you. Let me know what you're going to do as a result of this conversation. I will be back next Wednesday where I will share another inspiring guest. To make sure that you don't miss that, please do subscribe hit the bell and you will be notified as soon as it goes live. If you're curious to know how I, through Always Better Than Yesterday, can serve you, your team, your organisation, please do visit alwaysbetterthanyesterday.com and it will be my honour and privilege to help you in any way I can. Keep leading, my friends. I've been Ryan Hartley, host of the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast here on YouTube. Always love. <laughs>